Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, it is actually about 3.30 on Thursday, the 21st of April here in New York. We're recording this for release on Friday morning just because of our schedules on Friday morning. My topic today is precious metals index notes. It's a complex topic and in talking about whether we should do this, we realized how complex it is and how big it is. And we thought maybe we you know, should do something. It's time to talk about them. Uh, we've resisted talking about them in these videos in the past. It's time to talk about them. And so well, we're gonna try to do something a little bit risky here. We're going to try to give an introductory talk and touch on a lot of topics in terms of headlines, not necessarily superficially, but not in as much detail. And we do that realizing that there are any number of trolls and troglodytes and others who will try to pick apart things because we haven't provided you know, the, the full legally uh, defensible arguments for these things. But there are certain things happening that uh, have caused us to say, okay, we should start talking about this. And we've had various people encourage us to start delving into this issue. And insofar as we're trying to provide education and background and, and concrete information about precious metals investments to a broader investing community with these videos, it makes sense. I wanna start by thanking Bob Coleman at Profits Plus Precious Metals and Capital Management. Really smart guy. Uh, we've known him for some years and he's very good. He has been participating, uh, Tom Bodrovich of Palisades Gold has been having these five and six hour marathon uh, presentations, uh, discussions online, uh, talking about various aspects and, you know, the first 75 minutes of the first one that I watched was Tom asking and letting Bob explain futures markets, futures, uh, you know, the rationale, why they're structured the way they are, their, their critical role in the overall economy and such, as well as talking about bonds. And Bob has done a tremendous amount of work for all of us in gathering data and, and about related to the Bank of America's precious metals, specifically white precious metals, derivatives positions. There are people who um, have made a big deal out of this. They've made a mountain out of a molehill. Um, I don't know why, and I don't care to know why, uh, but Bob has gone in and looked at it and he's come up with some very interesting information. In addition to that, he has cajoled us into talking to him about derivatives, precious metals derivatives and commodity derivatives in a way that makes us think that it, it is uh, something that we should bring to a broader audience. And so we're gonna start talking about this. Stuff. We'll talk what are commodity derivatives and what aren't they? Um, I'll show you some examples of ours from the past. Uh, we'll talk about why many investors, especially institutional fund managers, don't like particularly direct investment in commodities, but they prefer to use derivatives uh, indexed to commodities uh, instead of direct commodities involvement. Talk a little bit about what we do and all. And then I'll go through some information on the size of derivatives markets. At the end of it all, I hope to be able to remember to mention that we will have an open forum coming up in the middle of May for our clients, open question and answer online. And then we will be having a silver seminar on June 1st. And they're on there, they're on the slide deck. Uh, hopefully I'll remember to get to it. So first off, what are derivatives? This is from the OEC, OCC, the Office of Controller of the Currencies, uh, quarterly reports. It came out in March and it goes through December of 2021. These are the open positions or the notional value of white precious metals contracts. They segregate gold and treat it separately because it's so much larger than other uh, precious metals and commodity derivatives positions. But you can see a large increase in the notional value 
the headline value of, of plat, uh, silver, platinum, and palladium uh, derivatives issued by banks. And as in almost every aspect of banking, there has been concentration of, of banks. So you have like three banks that handle most of the mortgages in America and all the other banks just feed them to them. And there are four banks that handle commodities derivatives or precious metals commodity uh, derivatives. But this is the value and you can see it's gone, you know, the, 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 the levels are kind of small, but it's gone from about 25, 30 billion dollars outstanding to about 75, 80 billion dollars outstanding uh, positions. And we'll put that in context later in on, but let's look at it. This is an index note. This is actually something that we structured in 2016. And these are the way we like to do it. This is actually a principal protected product. So you're not buying gold per se. What you're doing is you're buying exposure to gold prices. And you can do this. You'll have the uh, credit worthiness of the bank that's issuing this position to you or you can actually do it through an exchange and have the clearinghouse's credit position. So you have improved uh, liability and risks issues there with doing it. This is one that we structured, as I said, in 2016, and gold was kind of moving sideways. It gave you over a five-year period, I believe it was, you, could, uh, you had a, a principal protection. If you held the thing to maturity and the gold price didn't move, you got your principal back. So you gave up the interest rates, which were very low over that period to 2016 till now. And if the price rose, you got most of the exposure of rising gold prices. That's the kind of note that we like to do, that we have done traditionally. It can be done as a principal protected note. It can be done as a principal protected managed account, which is cheaper and more flexible. Uh, and a better way of doing things. And quite frankly, while we used to do these notes a lot in the 90s, uh, in the last 10, 20 years, we've tended more toward managed accounts because of the flexibility and lower costs involved in doing that. And we do it for individual clients that are accredited investors. Now, why do investors prefer derivatives to direct uh, investments in commodities? Well, there are a bunch of reasons. The most important reason is that you can structure these things, like the one I just showed you, that you have a better risk reward profile. You can have principal protected. We used to call them principal guaranteed, but lawyers in the 1990s said, hey, you got to stop saying guarantee. It's principal protected. We can have enhanced returns. You can do it with gold. You can do it with all kinds of commodities. You can do it with a basket of commodities. You can do it all sorts of ways. Many have tax issues. They are long-term investment funds. And if they earn too much or too large of a percentage of their profits in any given quarter from commodities, which the government considers short-term investments, it's kind of ironic because it's exact backwards. You know, people buy gold and they hold it forever. They buy uh, stocks and bonds and, and, and ETFs, and they tend to turn them within 12 to 15 months. But that said, the SEC looks at these things and says, okay, bonds and stocks are long-term investments. A, a long-term investment fund has a certain tax rate, but if it earns too much from a short-term investment like commodities, it can lose its long-term preferred tax status. So you don't do that. And we've done various things. I actually ran into an old client at a meeting yes, uh, yesterday uh, we had created a special purpose vehicle for them so that they could buy some specialty metals. They, they were a mutual fund. They had to make sure that they didn't get into a situation where they, the stock market and the bond market were falling at a time when commodity prices were rising and all of a sudden they lose their, their, their long-term tax status. So what they did is they created a special purpose vehicle, a company, the sole asset of which was specialty metals that we bought and, and managed for them. And they owned an equity. They were investing in an equity, so it wasn't a direct commodity investment. You can do that. You can do managed notes. You can do index notes. 
a lot of the notes were bought by institutional investors, partly because of that tax advantage. Second thing is the greater flexibility. And the third thing is you have your credit risk is a major bank. So it's a little bit clearer risks and liabilities, as I said. The preponderance, a lot of these guys have a preponderance of treasury bonds in their portfolios. So they're looking to diversify away from those treasuries. How do you deploy them? I'll show you a chart later from the OCC report where you can see the preponderance of treasury notes in the derivatives books, which are something like $250 trillion now. Uh, the managers of these funds are trained in equities and bonds. They're used to equities where you have the SEC saying, hey, you can't say stuff unless it's true about that equity or unless you have information that suggests it's true or bonds where it's pretty much math. And you get into commodities where there's all kinds of nonsense spewing about, say, how do I invest in something that is so overrun with that kind of information? So a lot of fund managers are extremely uncomfortable with commodities because of the opacity, the lack of transparency, the uh, preponderance of bad data. You know, I was once at a ta uh, meeting with a bunch of mining executives and I was talking about the preponderance of bad information in the precious metals markets. And they said, oh, you're talking about the conspiracy guys. I said, no, 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 no. I'm talking about the people who supply reports to marketing agents who tout gold and silver and platinum as investments, and they have really bad data. Um, and you see that still today. That was 20 some odd years ago. Commodities are strange to them. These things can be more flexible. There are a variety of reasons why people, especially institutional fund managers, prefer an indexed note, a, a bond, to something uh, like a direct commodity. Now, it's very important to understand this. Virtually all of these investors would not buy physical metals in the absence of these products. You'll hear over and over again, people say, well, if these derivatives and futures and options and forwards and index notes and all this other stuff did not exist, these people would be buying physical gold and silver and the prices would rise. That's wrong. Most of these people would not touch physical metals, A, because there's tax restrictions, B, because they're bond investors and they don't like opaque, misinformed markets. As one of our hedge fund clients said in 2001, when we recommended gold uh, to him, he met with the CEO and CFO of one of the world's largest gold mining companies. And he said, I'm just a poor boy from the oil patch but I know more about gold than the CEO and CFO of one of the world's largest gold mining companies. And I cannot break my fiduciary responsibility to my investors in my hedge fund by investing in, a, in an industry that knows itself so poorly. They won't do it. So, and then many of them find the precious metals kind of distasteful because they're overrun with unsavory, dishonest people. Now, when Jay Earn was bought by Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs was shocked at the number of Goldman Sachs employees who actually owned gold and silver and were at Jay Aaron's clients already. And, and you have these conversations where the Goldman people would say, well, I didn't know that you invested in gold. And Goldman and, and, and the investor would say, well, you've always said that gold was for crazy people and I didn't want you to think that I was crazy. So I just didn't tell you that I was buying gold. You know, so there's this distaste on mainstream investors, which goes back to that other thing. It's like, well, if ever, when everybody starts buying gold, everyone will not start buying gold. A, because in the United States and Europe, most people can't afford an ounce of gold. They don't have enough discretionary savings to buy an ounce of gold. Uh, but the other thing is that many of them find the people that you associate with in the gold market rather distasteful to 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 to, to to talk to, so they just avoid it. So these people are not, these derivatives are not distracting investment funds away from gold and silver. These investors almost all exclusively would not invest in precious metals directly if these derivatives were not there. 
the fact that the derivatives are there make precious metals more affordable and profitable to stay in for purveyors of precious metals assets, including physical metals. So they actually help the liquidity and they help the, the mechanical mechanisms of the precious metals markets. This is another gold structure note that we did from June 2000. It's kind of hard to see. You can see the full template uh, on, the, on the right. And then on the left, you can sort of see the top of it. And this was a guaranteed index note that we structured at the bottom of the market. And you got almost all of the upside exposure if the gold price rose. And if the gold price fell over a three to four year period, you, you, you made out like a bandit as well. So that was a pretty good type of thing. And I should talk about that a little bit because these are the kinds of things that CPM Group does. And these are the kinds of things, you know, I've made the comment before that we do less than 1% of our revenue comes from sell side investment banks and trading companies. They're not necessarily our clients. Most of our revenue comes from institutional investors or mining companies or other uh, entities. Uh, sell side institutions and trading operations are not particularly uh, love us. And one of the reasons they do it is because we come up with stuff like this. So an investment bank might say, hey, I have an index note and it's indexed to the price of silver, it's indexed to the price of gold, blah, 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 here it is. Their institutional investors will show that to us and say, what do you think? We'll say, yeah, this isn't so great tell them that if they put together a note with this kind of p l and we can help them do it you'll do 10 million dollars right and then the bank which you know let's be honest banks that offer and sell site uh on the sell side institutions often structure notes and investment products that are more beneficial for them at the expense of their customers so one of the things that we do we do it with asset management and with structured notes like this. But we also do it with hedging strategies, is we take away some of the gravy that the banks would normally keep for themselves, and we give it back to the investor clients that we share with them. And that's one of the reasons why banks don't necessarily like us so much. Yeah, you know, one of the first things that we ever did, when I was still at J. Aaron Goldman Sachs, I came up with the idea of a Freeport MacMoran copper index preferred share. And I used a very simple formula so that anybody that bought these preferred shares that had a, a special dividend index to the price of copper, they could take the Wall Street Journal in the morning, back when the Wall Street Journal published copper prices uh, on a daily table, and say, this is a Freeport share, this is the price of copper, this is what this preferred share would be worth. And we came up with this idea and, and the Goldman Equity Derivatives Department made it into a formula that quite frankly, the treasury operation at Freeport McMoran could not figure out what the price of these shares should be given any particular price of the underlying Freeport shares and the price of copper. So make it very complex. We try to keep it simple. And as you know, Warren Buffett always says, if you don't understand an investment, you ought not to invest in it. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've done. Yeah, another one that we did, this one is from 2004 when the gold price was starting to rise and we gave somebody a, a principal protected note that you know over a five year period of time, they could get at least their principal back. If the price of gold rose, they would make some of the upside. Uh, and if the gold price fell, uh, they would also make additional profits kinds of types of notes that we do. So this is the size of the total derivatives market, outstanding notional value at the end of 2021, $250 trillion. And these things up here are stocks and bonds, and down here are commodities and other things. I'll show it to you another way. See if you can find the commodities derivatives here. I'll give you a hint, it's a red bar. You can sort of see it pop up here a little bit and a little bit here. That's how important commodities are to the banks that offer these kinds of notes. The vast majority are bonds. Uh, 
in the interest rate bearing uh, interest rate notes. This is the white precious metals derivatives book, and yes, it has risen sharply. I showed you this chart at the beginning, and I'll show you. I'll put it in the context in a second. But you can see kind of rising slowly up until about 2017, 2018, 2019. Then it started rising more significantly. And that's very important for those of you who have a memory that's still functioning, because you'll remember that that's about when investment demand and interest in these commodities started rising. That's 2020, 2019, 18, 17, 16. It started rising again. This is the total notional value. And here you can see interest rate assets, $126 trillion. Foreign exchange assets, uh, $41 trillion. Equity, $4 trillion. Commodities, $1.6 trillion. Relatively small, eh, close to 10%, maybe. No, it's not. Sorry, you can't really read it, but you can get this note from the OCC.gov. And you can download the full report. It's, uh, I think, about 47 pages. Now, here's something that's very important because, you know, there are people who say, oh my God, look at this. Look at this enormous increase in derivatives. Oh my God, what's happening here? Somebody's doing something nefarious. Well, let's look at it compared to the prices of silver, platinum, palladium 2016 to 2021, as that big increase occurred. And you can see silver prices rose on annual average basis 47 percent palladium 288 percent on average just a simple average of the three 115 percent increase in the dollar value of those metals the precious metals derivatives rose 187 percent the notional value so there's about 72 percent of that increase that doesn't represent the increase of the prices of precious metals or if you want to look at it a different way, less than half of the increase in the notional value can be attributed to something other than the simple increase in the underlying assets, platinum, palladium, and silver. More than half of it represents the increases in those prices. But then there's this stuff that Bob came up with. He pulled a whole bunch of Bank of America and JP Morgan derivative note uh, prospectus, which are all registered with the SEC. This is a Bank of America note, uh, and you can see it's contingent income buffered auto callable yield note. It's a note that is indexed to an underlying asset, and the yield is indexed to it. And it's auto callable, which means that if something happens, the bank can say, okay, we're going to pull those, those notes sooner rather than let them stand till maturity. And that's actually kind of common. Here's another one accelerated return notes linked to the Van Eck Vectors gold mining ETF. And another one from JP Morgan, which Bob loves the uncapped contingent buffered return enhanced notes linked to the lesser performing of the gold trust, uh, spider gold trust, or the iShare silver trust. That's an interesting one. Now, we don't know because the data is not provided on an aggregate basis or a disaggregated basis by the OCC. We don't know, but there's a very good supposition, which Bob made, is that a lot of these call notes and there are just dozens of them from the Bank of America, as well as from Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, and there's a fourth bank that's involved uh, too. Um, there are just dozens and dozens of these, and they're almost all linked to the Van Eck Gold ETF, Miners ETF, the GLD, the ISHA. They're linked or indexed to it. They're not deliverable into it, there is a most, for the most case, these are indexed to some underlying asset. They're not attached where they're deliverable into the asset. So these are equity derivatives. They're not commodity derivatives. And one of the questions that Bob and I have both placed to the OCC or trying to place to the OCC, and we're 
not getting responses yet, is of that increase in commodities derivatives are a significant portion of those derivatives actually equity derivatives linked to equity ETFs or to ETFs on gold and silver, which are equities. Those are not necessarily physical metal. I mean, the ETFs have physical metal in them, but the derivatives that are indexed to the performance of those ETFs are, are not physical metal. They're not commodities. They are derivatives based on the value of an equity, which is the ETF. And it may well be, we just don't know, but Bob has asked and we CPM group has asked, and we'll continue to ask. It may well be that a lot of these things are being misreported. They're not actually commodity derivatives at all. They could be equity uh, derivatives. But even if that isn't the case, go back to that table that I talked about where you looked at this value. A big chunk, the majority of the increase in the dollar value of commodities derivatives can be explained by the increase in the prices of the actual commodities that either are indexed to those things or are indexed to ETFs that are indexed to those derivatives. So most of them are unattached to physical metals. Anything that happens to them is the liability of the bank that's issued it. It doesn't kick back or spill back into the physical precious metals market. The precious metals markets will never explode or collapse because of a problem in a derivative that's indexed to the value of those commodities because the derivative has no claim on physical precious metals. Very important to understand. Anyway, probably going on longer than I wanted to already. A few little uh, programming notes. As I said, CPM Group's next open forum for clients, just an open question and answer period online, May 18th. Uh, we'll be coming out with our, our silver yearbook on May 10th. Uh, I think I, last week I might've mentioned May 8th, and I apologize, that's a Sunday. Um, May 8th is a Tuesday. The following Wednesday, we'll do the open forum uh, on questions and answers. And then on June 1st, which I believe is also a Wednesday, it's two weeks before the PDAC, uh, we will have our online silver seminar as we did last year. And then we'll go into the uh, PDAC um, in the second week of June. You can sign up for our retail investor programs. You can buy our reports. You can get free reads and other things uh, at our website. And we'll be talking to you next week. Have a good weekend, take care, uh, stay safe, and take care of other people.